Debbie Marcou is licensed by the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation under the California Residential Mortgage Lending Act, NMLS ID 237926. Also licensed in Arizona, 0941504, Florida, L076508, Georgia, 69178, Idaho, MLO, 2080237926, Illinois, 031.0058339, Missouri, North Carolina, I210940, Nevada, 57237, Oregon, Tennessee, 184373, Texas, Washington, MLO, 237926. She's a mortgage mom. She can get things done When you're in need and don't know where to go Pick up the phone and call mom Have you been waiting to purchase a home until interest rates have come down? Well, guess what? They have come down. They are falling. We are at a great place today. If you took advantage of this program today and you also combined it with a 2-1 buy down, your interest rate year one would be at 3.5%, year two, 4.5%, and year three and remaining 27 years would be at 5.5%. This is a great opportunity to buy a home now before interest rates have fallen even further and now you've got to compete with those other people that are out looking at homes. Get out there, start looking at property, and take advantage. Give us a call so that we can help you get things started. It's 844-935-3634. That's 844-WE-LEND-FOR-YOU. W-E-L-E-N-D and the number four. All right, so welcome to Mortgage Mom Radio. I am Debbie Marcou. I am the Mortgage Mom. I can see that my dad has jumped on and said hi. So dad, thank you so much for joining. Um, This is going to be a very educational show. Um, My show is not a political show. This is not to talk about which administrations are better, who you should vote for, but it is an educational show. That is what I do this show for every single week. And it is to bring you guys the information that you need when making decisions for your family and whether or not you should be trying to get financing done right now, purchasing a home, uh, we go through all of those things. And obviously, all of the news is all over the place. You turn on anything, even just an NFL uh, football game right now, and you are just being bombarded with the commercials, you know, vote for this one, vote for that one. And a lot of people, they're, they're, Right now, their concerns are the economy and interest rates and prices of homes and things that are very, very important. So I wanted to do this show today to bring you guys kind of through an education. I'm going to take you through the eyes of a loan officer. So somebody like me who has been, well, I'm going to bring you through my eyes. Um, I have been in this industry now for 30 years, and so I go back a lot of different administrations. Um, But I want to bring you kind of through... Um, beginning with, honestly, Obama, the recession that we had in 08, 09, and then what has taken place and transpired from there. There are a lot of things that are being thrown out right now, such as, you know, as soon as Trump gets in the office, he's going to drop interest rates to 3%. That's been a phone call that I've gotten here recently. Um, as soon as Trump gets in office, uh, we're going to have better, you know, prices at the gas uh, station and we're going to have better grocery costs. Okay. So I'm going to kind of take you through what I've seen over a long history, because I think that it's very important to have an understanding of, you know, what has taken place, what I see, where I see that there have been problems that have created where we are today. And I think that it's really important to understand that nothing is going to be changed overnight. Nothing can, there isn't going to be a vote that happens and everything is going to miraculously get better you know, the next day or even maybe within a year. Things take time to unravel regardless of who you feel is going to be best, the best decision to get us from where we are today, which is honestly in a world of hurt, to where we'd really like to be where things are starting to get easier and less expensive for all of us as, um, you know, as United States, people living in the United States as citizens or you know, um, people that are here and handling, uh, you know, the economy and what is taking place and the inflation. So that is what today's show is going to be all about. I do um, want you guys to know that you are more than welcome to jump in the chat. Let me know that you are here. You can ask me questions if you'd like. You're more than welcome to throw out your statements that you'd like to make. 
Again, this is an educational show. I just want to bring you guys through what has gone on um, and where we are today and, and what I personally feel that it's going to take to get us out of the mess. So I think that it's an important show to do. And I want to start all the way back to the recession. That's where we're going to go to. We're not going to go any further um, back than that because I think that the, these are the most relevant years and years that a lot of us can remember. Even if you are um, a millennial or you're Gen Z, uh, you remember your parents going through that recession. It was really tough times. So I do want to talk about that. So basically, let's start there, okay? How did we get there? So in 04, 05, 06, uh, the banks were writing uh, extremely easy loans to get. They were called Nina's, CISA's. Um, everybody had a different term for them, but they were basically no income, no asset, stated income, stated asset loans. You could walk in and if you had a great credit score, you could get financing. You could possibly get financing without even showing proof of income with zero money down. So just about anybody who had a really good credit score and a heartbeat could get financing. That is what threw us into the recession that we ended up in. The people were purchasing homes that shouldn't have been purchasing homes that couldn't afford to buy homes. Um, you can go back and you can watch, uh, you know, uh, many different shows, but even, you know, um, I'm trying to think of what the name of it was. Uh, I, I'm kind of spacing right now, but there's actually a movie about it. And it was actually very, very on target with, with what took place back in that day. So the economy was being driven by people that were purchasing homes that could not afford those homes. And then as soon as property values started to drop, uh, they couldn't afford the homes. They couldn't keep flipping homes. They were buying homes and they were selling them, you know, not even holding on to that home for a couple of months. And they were walking away with money in their pocket. So they didn't care what kind of financing that they signed up for. They just knew that they were going to sign up for it. They were going to have to come up with a payment or two and that they were going to turn around and be able to sell the home and walk away with a profit. So that is what truly threw us into this absolute crazy slide of home value started to drop. People couldn't refinance because the homes were upside down in value and they couldn't sell because the homes were upside down in value. So they couldn't make their payments because they signed up for loans that they couldn't afford. So what ended up happening? Well, people started losing their homes. And as soon as that many foreclosures hit the market, now property values start to drop even more. So we had this massive recession, property values dropping like crazy, and people losing homes and foreclosures all over the place. So in comes Obama, okay? And Obama has walked into an absolute wreckage of an economy. And I'm not going to talk about who created it. It doesn't matter. Let's let's say that the banks created it. Let's let's blame the banks, okay? So You've got this massive problem that this guy walks into, and he has got to try to figure out how to pull us out of an absolute disaster. And to be honest with you, he did a really good job. And again, this is through the eyes of a loan officer, somebody who was writing loans in 04, 05, 06, who then saw loans come to a complete halt Nobody was purchasing homes. Interest rates had gone up. Everybody was upside down in value. Nobody could get refinancing done. It was really, really a horrible scenario, especially for somebody in the industry. I didn't have clients that could afford to buy a home. They could not afford to refinance. They did not have money to be able to bring in to gap the bridge of what the home was worth today. And then how much money did they owe on it? It was worth this and they owed this, right? They had to try to gap the bridge with money. Nobody had the money to do that. So we had a very, very difficult time even trying to help people to get into a payment that was affordable. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, they couldn't refinance, they couldn't sell. So they were going to the banks, and this is going to be part of your history for what happened in 2020, but they were going to the banks and they were trying to do loan modifications. They were trying to get the banks to give them a loan modification at a lower interest rate. Um, take the debt of the payments that they hadn't made that they were behind on, put them at the end of the loan in basically what's a refinance is a modification, but they were modifying. So these people, in order to get these modifications, they had to prove numerous things at that point in time. They had to prove 
that they had lost income from where their application was when they wrote the application. So somebody who did a stated income loan and didn't state what their true income was, they couldn't show proof of tax returns to show, hey, I was making, you know, $300,000 and then all of a sudden we're in recession and now I'm making a hundred or, you know, I was making a hundred and now I'm making 50. They couldn't prove that they had gone through a hardship and that that is why they got behind on the mortgage payments. So the bank said, nope, not gonna give you the modification and they foreclosed. Or you had somebody that could show that they lost a bunch of income because of that recession. So they show the tax returns and they show that they had this huge loss of income. But then they also had to be able to prove to the bank at the same time that if the bank did the modification, that they could then also handle making those new monthly payments that the bank was going to give them. So, okay, yes, we understand that you lost, you know, all of this income and that's what got you behind. Um, but show us your income now today. What are you earning today? Can you afford today to make a new payment if we're willing to modify this loan? Well, many of those people who had lost, uh, you know, more than half of their income because of recession in all different shapes and sizes of, you know, from losing a job to businesses, you know, being cut down into half of what they were earning previously, um, whatever their reason was, then if they couldn't show that they were at least making enough money to be able to make a new payment on the mortgage, once again, the bank said no, and they foreclosed on the home. So from that, we have all these foreclosures, right? And we also have a lot of people who are now suing the banks because they felt that the property was taken unrightfully. So the banks then ended up in a turmoil of even bigger mess. Okay, so that gets us into 2020 when people started doing modifications. So remember this part of the history. So Obama comes in and he's there and he's trying to pull us out of the recession. Again, I'm not going to talk about policies. I'm not going to talk about things that he did um, to try to make things better. But I'm going to talk to you about things that happened as a loan officer through his administration. So one of the things that they did, the government came out and worked with Freddie Mac and worked with Fannie Mae on was to, to introduce a loan program called a HARP refinance. And it was a home, of, a home affordability refinance protection is what HARP stand for, uh, stood for. So the HARP loan, what that did is it allowed us as loan officers and it allowed consumers, people that had mortgages, to be able to refinance their mortgage without having to get an appraisal done. We could refinance the loan if their interest rate was higher because again, interest rates had spiked up quite a bit, right? So a lot of people during that time frame that they were doing those stated income, stated asset loans were signing up for uh, adjustable rate mortgages. Many of them were taking five-year arms. That was one of the biggest programs and products at the time. A five-year arm, an interest-only payment, and so what happened was at the end of the five years, our interest rates spiked because we had got started to go into this recession. Banks didn't want to lend. They didn't only wanted to lend to people that they thought were going to be safe paper. And interest rates spiked up quite a bit. So if you were on an adjustable and your interest rate adjusted, all of a sudden that interest rate that you had had locked in spiked. It went up 2%, 3%, 4%, depending on how long earlier before that you had locked it in and where the interest rates were when it adjusted. Not only that, but if you had an interest only payment, you all of a sudden went into a principal and interest. So we had clients that we were seeing whose monthly payments had gone up $2,000 a month, almost doubled the monthly payment that they had signed up for. And so again, that created more, more hurt and they couldn't refinance and they were upside down in value. So from there, they created this HARP program that allowed you to do a refinance and it didn't matter if your property was upside down. You did not have to get an appraisal done. We did not have to show income. We did not have to show tax returns. We did not have to show you know W-2s and pay stubs. So we could take somebody that was upside down who had an interest rate, let's say at 7% or 7.5%, and we could refinance them into a better monthly payment. So interest rates at that point in time, in 09, in 2010, 2011, actually started to come down significantly. They were trying to get the economy moving. 
And so again, remember that this is going to be part of this history list lesson when we get to 2020, 10 years later. So 2010, 2011, HARP refinances are out. People can start refinancing who couldn't before. Interest rates are coming down because they are trying to stimulate and get that economy moving. So we were able to get people that had gone to a 7% rate or a 7.5% rate, 8 and a 3 quarter percent rate. And I remember seeing these come across my desk. And we were putting them into new interest rates that were in 3.5%, 4%, depending on where their credit score was. And the credit score guidelines were also significantly lower as well for these HARP refinance programs. So HARP really did save the day and it started to help people save their homes, not have to go into foreclosure, get their monthly payments into a better place that they could hold on to the home. And I give a lot of kudos to the people that did hold on to their properties during that time. It was really, really easy to say, you know what, my property has dropped $100,000 in value. I don't want to hold on to this property. It's doing nothing for me. My payment is higher than what it would be if I just went and I rented somewhere. I'm just going to let this property go. The people that held on to those homes, they did a great job because when we started to finally go back up in value again, if you look at where home values were in 2010, in 2011, and you look at where home values are today in 2024, they have far exceeded any losses that they had ever taken. So I have said this numerous times in my show, real estate is for the long haul, you guys. When you get into something, it is so important that you are getting into something that you can afford, you are getting into a monthly payment that you know that you can handle, and you make sure that it is a payment that you that you will be able to make for the next five to 10 years, no matter where the market or the economy goes, because that is what keeps your credit good. That's what keeps you in your home. Property values will drop. They do that. It is cyclical. It is part of the cycle of life. It is part of real estate, but they will always come up and they will go higher than where they were before. So we've got all of these people that are coming out of things. We're getting better, right? So now we're moving into 2014. Things are starting to get better. Home values are going up. Foreclosures are starting to um, all be sold off. So m many, many less foreclosures were on the market. Come 2014, 2015, there were very few that were left. So people that had the opportunity to buy foreclosures between 20, uh, I'd say 2010 and 2014 were able to grab steals of properties. So they really did a great investment at the time. Interest rates were down. They were trying to re-stimulate the economy and they did and they got it going. So I do want to say that from a loan officer, officer's perspective, what we went through and what was so devastating during Obama's time frame, we actually saw him really truly start to pull the economy out of wreckage. And again, I'm not talking about other policies. I'm not talking about anything else other than what we saw in real estate prices and what interest rates were and what loan programs were available at the time. Again, a loan officer's perspective through these administrations that we've been through. So now Trump comes in, it's 2016. Economy is back on track. Property values are slowly going up as they should. We want property values to go up in an even keel, right? We want them to slowly progressively go up over time. That is what we want. We don't want to see this massive, crazy, you know, spike in, you know, property values. You buy something and three months later, property values are through the roof. We, we don't want to see that. That is what puts us into a position of a massive decline of a crazy implosion. Okay. Um, so we see in 2016, we're getting back on track. Trump is um, in, you know, in, he just comes in at administration and things are doing what they should be doing. They're moving forward as they should be moving forward. Now, towards the end of Trump's term, we're getting into 2020 COVID hits. Okay. So COVID hits and here we are. Everything basically shut down. We didn't know as loan officers, were we going to be able to close loans, where people were going to be able to buy properties. Real estate agents didn't know if they were going to be able to hold open houses, show properties, write contracts. We didn't know if there were going to be notaries who could actually sign documents with people. So in order to stimulate the economy again, because they didn't want to see us go into this massive, crazy upheaval, the Federal Reserve walked in and said, we are going to drop rates to, to basically zero. Um, and when they did that, that just created this craziness, 
craziness within the market. And if you were trying to purchase a home during that time, you were a real estate agent during that time, you were a loan officer during that time, you saw a crazy, crazy change in the market. Everything went bananas. Everybody wanted to try to get in for interest rates that were two and a half percent, 2.9 percent. Every person that had a home loan that was until 2020, we were sitting right around 5.875, 6 percent, four and three quarters. So from 20, I would say about 2013, so about 2013, to about 2019, 2020, beginning of 2020, before everything went bananas, interest rates were anywhere from four and three quarters on average to about 6%, six and a quarter, depending on what was happening in the economy. So as I've talked about in numerous, numerous shows, inflation reports, unemployment reports, retail sales reports, all of those things feed into what goes on with mortgage interest rates. What is the Fed doing? What are they trying to s- stimulate? Are they dropping? Are they increasing? So really, we stayed very, very, I mean, if, if you think about the rates and scale from four and three quarters to about six and a quarter is a pretty median range. And we stayed there for a really long time. So 2020 comes, Fed walks in and says, dropping rates to near zero. They got that economy pumping. They got it stimulated. Real estate agents figured it out. They figured out how to show properties. They were having lines that were out the door. They were only letting one person in at a time to see properties. And things were starting to go haywire. They were going bonkers. People were paying more money than than what the property was listed for, more money than what the last house sold for. And if you were in the market at the time, you experienced it. So where I feel like we had a massive problem was that the Fed left rates too low for too long. They just left them too low for too long. So things were very, very stimulated for a lot longer than what was necessary. But as a loan officer, now I'm going to bring you into what was taking place. So again, 2020, Trump is in, Fed comes in, drops the rates. And I want to remind everybody that the Fed is a neutral third party. They have nothing to do with the actual president who is in office. They make the decisions for the Federal Reserve prime rate. They are a third party independent of any other party itself. So they made the choice to drop that interest rate to that point. They made the choice to leave that interest rate as low as they did. So as Trump was exiting office at the end of 2020 in January of 2021, um, inflation was low. Inflation was very low. Again, I want to remind everybody, though, just like we get reports right now, the only report that you can see, I was trying to Google it this morning for myself, was how are how are the mortgage defaults going right now? Are we seeing an uptick in mortgage default rates? Um, are we still doing okay? People making payments on time? It's what I do on the daily, right? I'm always constantly researching where are things at with the economy. The last report that you can find anywhere is March of 2024. Well, we're in October. So we don't really know what took place from through June. We don't know what's taken place from June through today, right? The report is not out yet to find that information. So again, inflation was super low. Trump is exiting. And we don't know for a fact that that's exactly where the inflation was because again, reports are a bit behind. But what we do know is that when he handed it over, inflation was low, interest rates were low. But was that Trump or was that the Federal Reserve, okay? So again, I'm not saying who was who you guys should be voting for. I'm not telling you which party was at fault. But this is what I have seen as a loan officer through my eyes. So we're in 2020. He exits. Now we're into our current administration. Now we're into Biden, okay? And all of the sudden, again, the Fed leaves the rates way too low for way too long, my opinion. So it it created this massive, huge inflation because for a very long period of time, anybody that could buy a home was trying to buy a home. They were paying more for the home than you know what it was listed for, more than the last sale that closed because they just wanted to get into a home with a really low interest rate. Then we also saw the current administration come in. And in my opinion, we saw a lot of spending, crazy, crazy spending on their part. Now let's back up just a minute. During COVID, we did have an issue where we had everybody getting stimulus. So again, they were trying to make sure that the economy didn't just absolutely crash. 
So just about everybody who was not in a highest income bracket started cre- getting stimulus checks. Nobody had to apply for these stimulus checks. You just got them. If you had kids, you were getting stimulus checks for having children. You didn't have to apply for it. It just got deposited into your account. Whose fault is that? I don't know. Who makes those decisions? I don't personally know. What I know is what I saw coming through the door, applications and talking with clients. What I also know happened during COVID, and now this is going to go back to the history lesson that I gave you with the banks and getting sued because they didn't give modifications and they didn't help people to not end up in a foreclosure and they were accused of taking people's homes without having the right to do so. So anybody at all during that 2020 and 2021 that called their bank who had a mortgage and said, I would like a a modification. I've lost income due to COVID. They were immediately granted it. Some banks, there were literally banks that were out there, servicers, who gave you a modification, gave you a deferral, a deferment on your loan, and you didn't even have to apply for it. So now we've got low interest rates trying to stimulate. We've got stimulus checks going out to everybody Um, If you qualified income wise, that didn't mean that you needed it. There were so many people that got stimulus checks that continued to work that didn't need the stimulus. So we're printing money. We're giving stimulus that people don't need it. You're not having to apply to get the stimulus to show the hardship. There were people that had a hardship during that time. One hundred percent. The nail salons, the hair salons, the um, restaurants. There were services and industries that absolutely had hardship. But if you worked a nine to five job at a desk, chances are you still had that job and you were working from home. You didn't necessarily need to have that modification. You didn't need to have that deferment on your mortgage. And you definitely didn't need to take advantage or you didn't take advantage. They just deposited it. Um, But you didn't need that stimulus check. So we had a bunch of people that were getting stimulus. We had a bunch of people that were on deferment with their mortgages, not making payments, who didn't need it, okay? So what does that do? That stimulates the economy even more. You guys saw it. Just go back to something stupid like like the the sneaker game, right? People had excess money. Um, They were spending, they were spending, they were spending. If they couldn't buy the shoe that they wanted on release date, they were paying double to get it from somewhere else. People had the money to spend. I had clients that were calling me that said, I want to refinance. I want to take advantage of the low rates. I said, okay, great. I pull credit. I see that their loan is currently on deferment. They haven't made a payment in six months. And I'm having to tell them I can't do a refinance for them until they get their loan out of deferment, get it modified for the balance that hasn't been paid. And they have to make at least six monthly payments before I can do the refinance application. And as I'm on the phone with these clients, they're talking to me about how they just completely redid their backyard. They just completely gutted and redid their entire kitchen. So people were spending money. The economy was on fire because people had money to spend. Why? Because stimulus that wasn't really needed and because modifications that weren't really needed. Again, this is what I see through the eyes of a loan officer. So once again, moving into Biden's administration, now you've got Rates are still low. The Fed hasn't moved the rate yet. The economy is pumping. People are spending. And then the new administration comes in and they continue to spend. And they they spend a lot of money. I mean, a lot of money. And you guys can go back to every policy and read up on it. But this administration has absolutely spent a ton of money. The Federal Reserve did not come in and say that they were going to start in, increasing the rates for again, way too long. They did not say that they were going to start to do that until near the end of 2021 and throughout all of 2022 and into 2023, we saw rate increase after rate increase after rate increase after rate increase. And again, the Federal Reserve is completely separated from any party, okay? They're making the decisions to run the economy as far as the interest rates go. So now we've got a ton of debt. We have, you know, uh, we've got a long way to go to turn things over. We've got inflation that is through the roof, which I believe was started by stimulus checks. 
people modifying loans and spending money and revving up the economy and paying more for homes than what the last one sold for, trying to get into that low interest rate. So I, I just want to make sure that I am taking you guys through a history lesson that you are understanding of kind of all, how all of this built up um, and what it's going to take to get us out of it. So once again, as I said at the beginning of the show, nothing is going to change overnight. We are in a humongous issue right now. We have got a huge bubble that needs to be unraveled, a huge yarn, a huge ball of yarn that needs to be unraveled for many, many years of issues at this point, okay? So who you feel is best to vote for, do so. But I want nobody to be under the assumption or the belief that they're going to vote and somebody is going to get into office or somebody is going to stay in office and all of a sudden things are going to change. I've heard people tell me, well, if Trump gets in, they're going to drop interest rates back to 3%. And I said that a little bit earlier in the show. He can't do that. He would have to completely get rid of the Federal Reserve. Yes, he's talked about wanting to do that. He's talked about that being something that he would like to do. At least that's what I see and what I read and who knows what's true and what isn't. Um, but that's not something that he can just make a decision to do. That is something that would be you know, a bill that has to be passed and you have to have legislature vote on it and it has to be something that makes it through things. That doesn't happen overnight. Nothing happens overnight. And that's all that I'm trying to tell you guys with my history lesson today. No matter who you feel is the best person to put in office for us, no matter who you feel is the right candidate to vote for to get us out of this mess, I just want everybody to be in the understanding that it is something that is going to take time. We have got a huge mess that needs to be unraveled. And it is not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in one year. It's not going to happen in two years. It is going to take probably a full term of office, a full presidential four years of office of unraveling to get our economy back in shape. And so I just want to make sure that you guys understand that when, you know, you, you, you can talk to somebody who's been pregnant before and they get really, really upset after they have the baby and they don't lose all of their weight immediately. And the doctor says, hey, it took you nine months to put it on. And I could tell you that it took me nine months to put it on. It took me three years to get it off. Um, nothing happens overnight, guys. And so I don't want anybody to be under those false uh, pretenses right now. What has happened currently was that we got our first rate cut. We all got really excited about the rate cut. We were told we're going to see rate cuts again in November. We're going to see rate cuts again in Dece um, December. And now with all of the, the news and all of the reports that are coming out and inflation coming in a little bit higher than expected, and the creation, the jobs report that came out, more jobs were, were created. You know, that's all pointing towards the fact that they may not cut rates at all come November, even though they told us that they would. If they do cut rates, it's probably not going to be by a half, which is what we've been hoping for. It's probably going to be more like a quarter if we get that rate cut. So what has that done? That has immediately sent interest rates up and through the roof again. So again, we're not where we were a year ago. Interest rates are still far, far better than they were. But we're going to get these dips and valleys and these dips and valleys are going to continue to happen, you know, for the next couple of years. This is what's going to take place until we get back to some normalcy. So where interest rates were when they made that announcement, and it's been about a month now, I think we've got two weeks until we get to our next meeting. So not next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after. Um, over this past month, we lost everything that we gained. So the day before they made the announcement was the very best interest rates that we've had with the anticipation of all of the investors and of the market saying that we're going to get these rate cuts. And those were that was the best day you could have possibly locked an interest rate. And now we've actually lost basically about a half of a percent in interest rates. Again, we're not where we were a year ago. We're not a point and a half higher like we were a year ago, but we've lost what we what we retained. So what is the lesson of the story? It is very, very difficult to time things. It is very, very difficult to say, well, they're saying that they're going to do this, so I'm going to wait for it. The best thing that you can do for you and for your family is to make decisions based on your time, on your timing, not the market's timing. Um, anybody that thought, hey, I needed to refinance. Those numbers sounded really good. I liked what I heard. And then they sat on it and they waited two weeks, which happened. We got a whole bunch of phone calls two weeks later oh, yes, I want to move forward now. And now the interest rate wasn't what we told somebody that it was going to be. 
Now the people that waited a month thinking that this coming November, we were going to see another rate cut and rates were just going to keep going down and going down and going down and going down. So the longer that they waited, the better. Interest rates are even higher than they were two weeks ago. So you have to make the decisions based on you and your family. Does the refinance make sense? Does it make sense right now? Can I afford the payment? Is it getting me out of the debt that I'm in? Is it helping me to add on to the property because my family is growing and I need to do it? If interest rates fall in the future, which they will, I do think that we are still on a long-term trend of rates will come down. Um, And we can always refinance it again later. If you need to purchase a home and now is the time for you, make sure no matter what you do, that what you buy, you can afford. Go back to my history lesson that I just gave you. Do not buy something that you can barely afford, that you're gonna be scraping by, and that your hope is that interest rates are gonna come down to save the day and you'll be able to refinance and make your payment affordable. Make sure if you buy something that you're buying something that you can afford for the long haul. We don't know what is going to come in the future. We don't know if we're going to see a massive drop in value and then you'd be stuck and couldn't sell your home or couldn't refinance like those people were that had bought in 2006 and seven and eight, right? So just whatever you're doing, the moral of the story is make sure that you're doing things that are for you and your family that you can afford and that make sense. And if it makes sense and you need to do it, pull the trigger, get it done. We can always drop the rate later when they come down further for a better monthly payment, Um, but you might miss out if interest rates are down and then all of a sudden news like what's gone on, what's taken place that nobody could have foreseen four weeks ago happens to actually bring interest rates up even higher and now you've just lost those savings that you thought you were gonna be able to have. So um, with that, I don't see any comments in my feed. I don't see any questions in my feed. I'm going to run a really quick commercial break. And when I get back, if there's no comments, no questions, no nothing, we're going to wrap up the show. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Are you in debt? Have you already pulled a home equity line of credit? And now those credit cards are charged up again? Don't feel bad. There are many people in your same position. It's been a really rough couple of years. But don't fret. Interest rates are starting to come down and you have the opportunity to do a refinance to get everything rolled up into one new loan payment. Give us a call. Let's take a look. Let's see what you owe. Let's calculate what those interest rates are on all of those balances. And let's see if we can't get you into a better financial position. Let's get that cash flow under control. Give us a call. It's 844-935-3634. That's 844-WE-LEND-FOR-YOU, W-E-L-E-N-D, and the number four. Or head on over to our website at MortgageMomRadio.com. Okay, so welcome back to Mortgage Mom Radio. I am Debbie Marcoux. I am the Mortgage Mom. I keep checking my chats. I don't see any. I don't see any questions. So I am going to leave it here with you guys. I gave you your history lesson of the day. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have further questions, you want to reach out to me, you want to talk more in detail, my door is always open. You guys are always welcome to call. You're always welcome to email. I absolutely invite you to. I, I you know, I invite you to get, you know, um, uh, in touch with me, and I would love to absolutely help you. I can see that Michelle says, "Are you licensed in Arizona?" Um, yes, I am. So I, I will actually, I'll do this really quick since Michelle asked. Thank you so much. I am licensed in. I think it's 11 states and I can see Heather says great information. And since Heather is on, I'm going to let her actually comment to make sure that I don't miss a state. Uh, But I am licensed in California, Arizona, Washington, Nevada, Texas, Illinois, Georgia, Tennessee, Florida, Idaho. (sighs) I feel like I'm missing one. I feel like North Carolina. And there might even be one more. So I feel like I might be missing one. Um, But I do have many states that I can help you in. So if you guys need anything at all in those states, Michelle, if you need my help in Arizona, absolutely would love to help you. Um, And Michelle says, how can a newly graduated college, hold on, I got to move this. I had something in my way of the chat. All right, here we go. How can a newly graduated college, uh, I'm assuming student, qualify to buy if he just started working? Um, So actually, if you go to school and you can show that you have gone to school with your transcripts and whatever you went to school for, it doesn't necessarily have to be an associate or or a bachelor's. 
It could be somebody that went to a trade school to learn the trade that they get into. But if you can show that you went to school for the job that you are doing, your school time, the time that you put in to earn that job will actually be looked at as your employment history. So we can take that as your two-year history that you did. Um, and, and then basically we're gonna look at what are you earning today in the job that you're in. And that is what we are going to use to qualify you. So you don't necessarily have to have two years of W-2s or um, two years history at the job that you're in, but we do need to show that you've been in school. So that is definitely something that you can do. Um, and uh, he said uh, he does have savings. So savings is great. I mean, obviously that's something that always helps. And uh, Michelle says he is an engineer from Berkeley. So that that's awesome. So we're gonna show his school transcripts and that he's been there and that now he's got a job in the field that he went to school for. That's gonna handle the two-year job history that is required. And we can look at um, his income today to, to figure out what he would qualify for. So he does not have to be at that job for a full two years. I've had people that um, have gone to school uh, for phlebotomy. That doesn't necessarily even take two years to get done. And uh, they get their job and they start doing that. And we, we can use that. We just have to show that they've, you've gone to school for the trade that you are in. Um, so that, that, is, that is absolutely perfect. That's a great question. And again, if any of you guys have um, questions that you want to ask me and I finish up the, the show and we don't have the chat going, uh, you know, you guys are always welcome to reach out. My office is always open. You guys can call me. You can email me however you'd like to get in, in uh, touch with me. Um, Heather did say great information and in that I did hit all of the states. So that's really good. Um, so I'm going to read them to you too. And he, um, uh, Heather says, Arizona, California, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Illinois, Nevada, North Carolina, Oregon. I knew I missed one. Oregon, Tennessee, Texas, and Washington. So those are all of the states that you guys, I can personally help you with. Uh, my company has more licenses than that. So if it is in a state that I am not personally licensed, I can always get you over to a loan officer as well who works with me, who can help you to um, get financing where you are located. Um, and uh, Michelle says his, high, his FICO is very high. So Michelle, honestly, just, just have, it sounds like maybe you're talking about your son, um, have him reach out, absolutely happy to help. And we can get him pre-qualified and get him ready to get out there and start looking at homes. Um, so with that next week, always every single Wednesday at one o'clock, you guys, I get on here and I try to bring you something new, something educational, something about all things real estate and mortgage. That's what we talk about. Make sure that you subscribe to the channel. I only send out a text message about once a month. Um, I'm not doing it every single week. I don't want to spam you. I don't want to bother you guys. Um, so make sure that you do subscribe to the channel for uh, YouTube. That's where most of you are watching. If you are uh, watching on Facebook, that's fabulous as well. Just make sure that you follow my page. That way you do get the reminder that I've gone live. Um, but always Wednesday, right between 1 and 1.15, I'm on. And make sure that you guys do subscribe. If you enjoyed the show today, if you liked what I talked about, you felt like it was a great history lesson, please give me a thumbs up. That's very, very helpful for my algorithm. Um, and one more question. Uh, Michelle asks, can I buy property without using a realtor? You can always buy property without using a realtor. That's always been um, allowed. That's, it's, it is not a law that you have to have a real estate agent help you when buying property. It is absolutely helpful uh, to have a real estate agent help you. It's, it's almost like throwing away a free attorney. If you're, you know, if an agent can help you um, and you can negotiate with the seller for the seller to pay that agent's commission, then you didn't pay it out of pocket and you had that person um, that was behind you and supporting you and advising you throughout your transaction, but it is not a requirement. You do not have to. You've always been allowed to buy something on your own. Um, people can sell their homes on their own. That's why they've got for sale by owners or FISBOs, some people will call them. It is absolutely never a requirement to use a realtor, but I would absolutely recommend it. I do think that it is something that is very, very valuable and worth every single penny. And especially if you are purchasing, if you can get the seller to pay the, your real estate agent's commission, then it costs you nothing and you had all of the information that you needed and all of the help and support. So um, I'm gonna wrap up the show, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. And I hope that you guys all come back again next Wednesday, right here on YouTube and Facebook at one o'clock. We'll talk to you guys all real soon. Bye-bye.
Debbie Marcoux is licensed by the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation under the California Residential Mortgage Lending Act, NMLS ID 237926. Also licensed in Arizona, 0941504, Florida, L076508, Georgia, 69178, Idaho, MLO, 2080237926, Illinois, 031.0058339, Missouri, North Carolina, I210940, Nevada, 57237, Oregon, Tennessee, 184373, Texas, Washington, MLO, 237926. She's a mortgage mom. She can get things done When you're in need and don't know where to go Pick up the phone and call mom 